Hello and welcome. We're looking at another free virtual. It's uh, the WBSIM JP Logistics uh, Cessna 152, which is um, a, an extended modded version of the default 152. At least it used to be a mod of the default Azobo 152. Um, originally we had from JP Logistics, we had this package uh, that he, or they, I'm not sure if it's one or more people that uh, were developed uh, and improved a little bit on the aerodynamics and uh, power engine and so on. Just made it that little bit uh, more realistic. Um, and it seems that there is now a version 2 or actually it's now called slightly different because there has been a second uh, group of people, I think, that have joined uh, also doing 152 mod and that's the WBSIM. And in combination from the changes coming from JP Logistics and from WBSIM gives us this new package, which is a Cessna 152 mod, which is not really a mod because um, they have packaged and, um, the original 152 and everything that belongs into a separate package. And not only that, um, they also added more models. So what we see here is uh, uh, kind of the standard 152, but there's one with, with I think, Tundra wheels or something bigger. Um, uh, we are, yeah and uh, some, some bush variants and things like that. So they're, they're, it's really from, from a simple, we make the default Azobo 152 a little bit better, although it is not the, the worst. I mean, the 152, I always liked it from the start and I liked flying with it. It's easy to fly the original Azobo one because it has been made easy to fly, which is good. Um, but this one here is more realistic to fly, which also means you can make mistakes and uh, yeah, it might turn out not so great if you re really make big mistakes <laughs> with this one. And if you consider that this is freeware, it's always fantastic. Uh, frames are currently somewhere between 55 and 65. In other words, this airplane does not take away from your frames. It needs practically almost nothing, which is also a great thing. Um, and it means that uh, probably almost all sceneries that you have, this thing will perform very good. Uh, even in very complex sceneries, the aircraft will not be the reason why your frames drop drastically. All right, um, now this looks like almost uh, the default thing, but uh, the eagle-eyed or the keen-eyed of you will realize that I think they're called fairings in English. Uh, these covers here for the wheels, they're actually new. The original one doesn't have that. I turned them on and uh, now let's uh, jump. Well, let's first do a little outside check here. So this is what the aircraft looks from around. As usual, I still haven't got the same visual settings as I have in X-Plane, which is also very difficult for me because when I switch between X-Plane and MSFS, um, I have slightly different keys because I have no choice and they behave slightly different. Um, and it's very difficult for me to actually create the views easily as I can in X-Plane 11 in, in MSFS. Um, yeah, but uh, it's okay. I mean, you get used to it. And I have messed around with my joystick button settings a lot in order to have it as equal, because you may have realized that from time to time, uh, things start moving in the wrong direction or I had a, I had actually in MSFS, I had the roll, view roll something axis, which, which actually made, uh, instead of going around the aircraft or so, it actually turned it uh, uh, vertically. <laughs> yeah. So I, I've, I've changed all that. So at least now you should not see me doing strange things with the views from time to time. I hope that 
this is the past. Um, yeah, very nice aircraft. The two pilots in there, which we only see when we are from the outside. Now let's jump into the cockpit and uh, looks the same, doesn't it? Like uh, <laughs> there's no real difference between the Azobo one and this one. So what's all the fuss about? Um, only the parameters. Watch this. I know. I mean, different people have different priorities when it comes to what should an aircraft in a simulator can do. One of them is wing flex. People are really obsessed with wing flex on larger aircraft, which I don't care about at all. <laughs> because I, I hardly ever look at the wings and I don't care if they whip or not. But one thing that I always hated in MSF is from the start is the fact that I have to that I can't open doors, right? And I thought it can't be that difficult to make a model that opens the doors, just to give this little bit of immersion. And if windows can be opened as well, the better. Right then, there you go. Ah, doors opening. This has become a real um, priority factor for me. So if something, a mod or, or a payo aircraft, opens doors, I'm all for it. Well, at least as long as I'm just looking at it from the outside or at the outside model. Um, and lo and look this. Oh, window doesn't open. Hmm, no. What do you do when you open the window? You unlock it and then you push it. And what do you do to close it again? You... Well, you would, yeah, and that's a little bit, uh, oh, by the way, let's close it, yeah? Uh-uh, flappy, flappy. <laughs> you open it, you close it properly, and then you close it. So not only did, did they implement windows and doors, but they made the windows pretty realistic. Yeah, uh, just, they, yeah, you, you can call me stupid now because I'm so fascinated about that but this for me makes an awful lot of difference yeah it's small things that that really makes you feel a bit more like you are in a real aircraft uh, and not just hop into some uh, arcade game thing yeah. but that's not all I, I said it looks the same, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, you wait what I show you now. Let's... Uh, uh, what's this here? Someone forgot his iPad. Huh? Not a good idea. You shouldn't really leave your iPad like this uh, in an aircraft. Uh, there's a click spot. You click on it and nothing happens. Yeah, well, that's a little... Yeah, I wouldn't call it bug, but let's say something that can be optimized. You need to find the right place. If you do, looky, looky. And I actually defined a view. <laughs> wow, eh? Freeware. Right? The 152, the most simple Cessna aircraft we have in this simulator. And now suddenly we have a pad, a IF, EFB, whatever you want to call it. A thing that also the large and complex um, freeware and payware add-ons have. Okay, you can't do Navigraph and all of that. Yeah. But look at this here. Cold and dark and ready for flight. They have implemented states. Hey! Which means I could press ready for flight now and the whole aircraft would spring to life and we could basically start rolling and, and flying. Fantastic. Or I press cold and dark and the aircraft is in a defined cold and dark state from which you can then do your little procedures and for the operating procedures for this, for this aircraft, if you have checklists, if you have some realistic documentation, you could do this. And with this aircraft, you're much closer to, to doing this than with the default version of it. Yeah. By the way, let's jump here. Uh, it's a bit weird with the iPad floating in the middle of everything, but uh, still. <laughs> I just love it. Fuses, right? 
fuses in, as, uh, well, not only, by the way, not only in MSFs, but with all the standard aircraft and a lot of the payware aircraft that you get. The fuses are a graphical gimmick. You can see them, but you cannot interact with them. There are some exceptions in X-Plane, in Prepared, in MSFs, where you can actually use the, the, the fuses. And now, in a freeware, look at this. And if you turn off that fuse, whatever is attached to this, in this case something with the radios, will not work anymore. Or the instrument lights, or the flaps, which are electric in this aircraft, or the landing lights, or the strobe lights. Huh? What do you say to that? <laughs> I was so impressed when I saw this. Um, yeah, amazing. Actually, not sure what this is. This looks, well, let me see. Can we guess from what we see here? Five, two, I mean, there are fuses. Uh, yeah, but the switch is not coded. Okay. Looks like a main, something like a main switch or something. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, look at this old ADF. This is really kind of from the last century, <laughs> almost literally. Um, I already spent about three hours on this particular aircraft. It started with zero, and then I had some difficulties. I had some difficulties. The thing is, I downloaded this from the URL, which I hope I don't forget to put in the description of the video. And if I do, please let me know by a comment. Oh, and by the way, this is not a tutorial, okay? I haven't read the documentation. By the way, there isn't any. Um, and I'm not going to explain everything. I'm not going to fly it like a pro, because I'm not a pro, all right? So if you're after getting everything explained about the uh, Cessna 152, uh, this might not be the right video for you. But if you like just watching me uh, getting to know it a bit better and sort of a first impression, um, then by all means, stay here and have fun. And I'm in a good mood today, so I think I'm <laughs> we're going to have fun. I'm definitely going to make mistakes. Um, but this aircraft in general, also the 152 in real life, is, is a very docile, very forgiving aircraft. There is not that much you can do wrong with it, also in real life. Yeah. Um, and for me, it's, I, I was really happy when I saw that MSFS came with 152 because for me, this is the aircraft that I use for exploring things or for doing at location videos or just generally, like just recently we had a live stream um, where we were flying in the Okavango Delta in Africa. And I used this aircraft because it's a, a nice mix of not too fast. You can go slow with it. Yeah. Not too slow, obviously, because things go <laughs> horribly wrong if you do even in this aircraft. But what means horribly wrong? Stalling in this aircraft, unless you're really a few meters above the ground. Um, it, as I say, it is, it's easy to get out of uh, unexpected and not really good um, flight states. Because as in real life, this aircraft is very forgiving and that's one of the reasons why the 152 is still used and was used by uh, flight schools around the world a lot yeah because it is something that even beginners and i still consider myself a beginner um, when it comes to these things they it, it, they're just a very good aircraft to start with and find out all about flying and, and how you do it it's also simple to, to use. As you can see, there isn't that many switches. There's the basic uh, navigation equipment. There's no autopilot. Yeah. Well, having said that, in this aircraft, if you really, really want to, if you really, really want to, you can turn yourself. You, you kind of uh, get the, the toolbox and you get a package from one of those delivery services. In there is an autopilot module that you then stick in your aircraft. And here you go. Now, I have to say, 
I hope it works now that I do the video because in my previous attempts it did not work. I couldn't turn it on. It would immediately disconnect again and I haven't found out what is missing. Well, we shall see. Um, with a bit of luck, it does work. To, to me, it wasn't a tra tragedy now that, uh, that it didn't work in my previous uh, test flights because uh, I don't really need it. In the 152, I don't need an autopilot. The autopilot would be nice to have if I do, um, yeah, if I do kind of flights like in the stream because it's a bit harder for me in a stream scenario. Let's turn these off here and just realize. It is difficult for me in, in the stream scenario uh, because I would like to show you um, as much outside view as possible. And uh, I, I have two things that I use in this case. I have Air Manager, the app, and uh, it connects. And I have a very simple, I put myself a very simple panel with all the most important things. There's the RPM, there's the airspeed, there's the altitude. Um, a compass, uh, a vertical speed indicator, and the, the turn coordinator. That's it. I don't have more, just so that I know what's going on. Uh, I didn't find an ADI, the horizon here, um, but I actually realized I don't really need it because when I do visual flying, my eyes and the view outside, I do visual flying, okay? So I do see things. I'm not flying in a cloud. That wouldn't be visual anyway. <laughs> And I don't need it because I can see where the horizon is. I can see that my nose is diving down or, or going up. And uh, it's actually very good. And the rest, these instruments tell me. The other thing is when I'm on a stream, I talk a lot and concentrate, unfortunately, on other things as well, you know, also on the outside uh, views, which in MSF is, are fantastic. So. I had always wished that the 152 could be flown with an autopilot that I can turn on and then it keeps the altitude and, and the heading. And I can use my, my heading uh, knobs here on the, on the Bravo and the autopilot knobs uh, switches at the top where I can just change the heading and then the aircraft would turn and I don't have to look into, into the cockpit. So yeah, I was a little bit <laughs> disappointed that it wouldn't work. But there was another thing that didn't work. Actually, well, there were a lot of things that didn't work at the beginning, and they have all started to work now. So <laughs> with a bit of luck, we actually might be uh, seeing them. Because looky, looky, what does it say here? Hmm. 152 with a GTN 750. So you, you got your toolbox and a very expensive package coming from one of these delivery services. And it's a GTN 750. It's probably a couple of thousand bucks and a lot of work to put it in. You turn it on and look here. It's thrown out all these old uh, radio and whatever equipment and put in a box somewhere in, in the innards here behind the panel. And that, uh, that Garmin front head here. And as soon as I turn on the battery, you will see, and well, that didn't work before. I know it works now. And I'm not sure what I did different, apart from restarting everything, <laughs> but it does work now. Hey! Um, it's not a big problem because uh, when it didn't work, I was still able to bring out the window, which is here. Huh? I was still able to do that. So um, should it not work, uh, Again, for me, it's fine because for me, this is actually a very good map because the inbuilt Azobo map is, eh, yeah, yeah, it's not great. So I prefer this here, uh, with giving me all the information and having everything you need, including the frequencies and so on, all in one, in one place. And if the autopilot should work now, we're going to use it as well. It will actually depend what we are flying because I do have a certain route that I would fly with uh, small aircraft that, um, that do have autopilot and navigation equipment. And I show you this here. This is my 
try and fly um, special scenario. There's just one little thing that is not possible to do with this here, with this combination. See this WP2? This is a custom waypoint. The PMS 50 or 750 that I have here is the freeware version. I am not able to define custom waypoints as I did here. So in that case, uh, we are going to fly from DS429 over to FATA and then establish ourselves on the ILS, provided that that stuff works. If not, then we're just going to fly a probably pretty crooked uh, round, which roughly follows this this year. <laughs> All right, uh, just to learn a bit more about the aircraft. Again, this is a try and fly type scenario. I'm trying things out. Yes, uh, this is not the very first flight I'm doing with it, and I'm already quite uh, impressed of it, as you will see when we do it. Yep. So, let me see, does little nav map show up? Yeah, but, yeah, it's a bit, yeah, the position is not exactly great. Let me quickly uh, find it. Where is it? Here, little nav map. And um, now let me bring this over a bit. So, let's do it like that. I think it's a bit better. It's not as much in the way here in OBS. Nice. Yeah, much better. All right, but well, we don't need it now. Okay, GTN 750, but well, we're not done yet. Um, there is a pretty, yeah, a pretty useless clock here in the middle of the panel. Useless because it doesn't have anything like a stopwatch or something. It's just showing the time in the simulator. And that's actually something that, yeah, nice to have, but <laughs> I'm not looking at this clock. What you can do, though, is replace it with something a bit more meaningful. Um, namely, with an EGT exhaust gas temperature instrument. Let me... Uh, yeah, uh, hang on. What is this? Why? I must have uh, messed up on the button. As I told you at the beginning, I have reprogrammed the buttons. <laughs> I didn't realize I have again <laughs> managed to get something useless programmed again. Anyway. Um, yeah, it's an EGT. There is the yellow thing. Uh, you can. It's kind of a limit. So you, you, if you know a bit more about, and I'm not a pro, so I can't tell you exactly how you use it. Um, you can actually put it on a on a an intended EGT that you, you don't want to exceed. Uh, you want to use for your flight, and then you will use something like the uh, mixture and power and uh, kind of trim the aircraft to a particular EGT. So it's, it's an instrument that will help you to be a bit better in, in fine-tuning the engine during flight, which in this case is somewhat important because they have put in realism, which means you shouldn't immediately head off with cold oil or low oil pressure because you will ruin the engine. And you can also even make, uh, if you flood the engine, that means uh, you somehow manage to get too much fuel in there, too rich mixture for uh, whatever. Um, you will actually end up with a fire in the engine. Yeah, in the 152. You will not, that will not happen to you in the, in the default one, but it will happen to you in this one. How do I know? Yes. <laughs> that was the first time I saw fire in the 152 because I was... I actually intentionally overdone it just to see are they telling me some wild goose story here or is this really true? And uh, yeah, I can confirm. If you flood the engine and you're unlucky, you suddenly have smoke and flames coming out of the engine. So be careful. <laughs> and that's what I find really fantastic because... Uh, 
it's not that this aircraft has become so complex to fly uh, and, and you have to ha kind of have to be afraid of, of, of doing something wrong all the time. No, if, if you kind of stay reasonable with your gas, with um, do a little bit of mixture of leaning roughly, you know, I also don't know the exact rules how you do it and what's the optimal temperature and all that. Nah, I don't know myself. But just uh, do a little bit of leaning, make sure that you're not... Uh, Flooding the engine during during startup uh, stuff like that, um, which is not that difficult to do, and the aircraft, like in the real world, will 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 be the best pal here in the air that you can have. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But by the way, I have been sitting in 152s for kind of um, trial hours and 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 also. Around fly, fl flying around and kind of doing scenic, uh, scenic tours. Um, so the panels did look a bit different in the ones that I was in, but it was nevertheless 152. One of them was really old, a really old one, but that's also a long time ago, like we're talking last century when I was in that one. But these things get old. Yeah, there are some really old uh, versions of them out there, and uh, a lot of their owners take good care of them. So, yeah, let's go back to this thing. Let's imagine you do not use the GTN 750. You do have the option to get a more modern DME equipment. It's here, so it, it displays distance measuring equipment you don't know. It displays the DME values for your NAV radios because you do have two. NAV1, NAV2, COM1, COM2 and the same in the GTN. Actually I have to check how you switch uh, to the second one. Oh yeah I just remember. Well usually I only use NAV1 and COM1 um, but now that I come to think of it I need to find out how I switch between uh, radios in the GTN. Yeah, so that's the one thing. The other thing uh, is actually a more modern transponder, which actually might be necessary nowadays because there have been changes. Yeah, so this is what the modern version um, looks like. Yep, it's a, with a display, ident button, VFR function, course, start, stop. I mean, they're all, all these buttons are coded. And uh, yeah, so you kind of vamp up your your equipment a bit. And the ultimate uh, ramping up is actually the GTN 750 because it uh, combines all of these. Um, you can take them out of your of your panel, and uh, they're getting replaced by this. Ah, uh, I think I know how we get to NAV2 because I can't remember seeing it in the GTN. Here it is. So in the case where you have the GTN in, which I actually didn't see that. <laughs> um, there's a COM2 and NAV2 as uh, traditional equipment here in the slots on the side. Hey, fantastic. And an ADF, so a receiver for the NDBs out there. It gets less and less likely that you're going to use that, but it's still there. Um, as far as I understand, also in the real world, uh, there's less and less of these NDBs uh, being available because everything has been turned over to RNAV, but they're still there. I mean, it's not that they're completely gone. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess over the years this will... Modern computers and GPS and co will replace probably a lot of the old fashioned infrastructure and radio navigation transmitters over time. Now here, maintenance. You can change the battery because if you've actually let the battery on, well, if I would have turned the battery on now, um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure, a uh, charge, not change, blah, 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 nonsense. If I would have turned the battery on now and we would have been talking for half an hour, or how long? Yeah, half an hour. Um, chances are I would now need to charge the battery because I wouldn't be able to get the engine started. Huh? Also, the oil, um, 
Yep, it simulates that the oil is used up as it is in real life. No? Slowly but surely, oil is getting less and it's also getting old. So from time to time, you should probably do an oil change or at least make sure that the, the oil reservoir, the tank is actually full. In this case, it's 6.6 .6 liters. And the engine health is still 100%. Yay! But it will get less, especially if you make mistakes, this value will go down. That's as far as I understood from the kind of release notes and the text file that's in there. So they really have done a lot of interesting features. Um, fantastic. Yeah. Then there are some more settings. This is actually, I to uh, told you before, they have state saving. How cool is that? When I started this aircraft, it actually started exactly with the door open. The door came open, the window came open because I, when I stopped it and I, I closed the simulator, that's what it was. I had it turned off. I brought it into kind of cold and dark manually. And uh, I had the door open and the window open. And when I started it, track opened the door and the window and I was first a bit surprised, and then I, I, I remembered, oh, hang on, they do have states. Cold and dark and ready for flight are predetermined states, but uh, it will also remember how you leave the aircraft, as it would be in real world. If you just leave your aircraft with everything open, um, don't be surprised. Next time you come to it, you will see still the doors open. Maybe someone has grabbed something out of it. Or maybe some animal thought it might be a nice place to put up a nest or... Anyway, you can show the pilots and co-pilot now. That's something I'm really glad that they make it optional because I don't like that. Why do I don't like that? Yeah, because uh, you have some... Sometimes, oh yeah, it's okay. Uh, but look at this now. So, <laughs> I don't need that. Uh, I'm not feeling lonely in the cockpit. I don't need avatars in there. Exterior. This aircraft, again, for a bit of realism. Look at that. We have chocks. We have, oh, hang on. Press the wrong button. So, this one. We have chocks. Uh, we have covers here. Uh, removed before flight. Also here, the pitot. Um, yeah, so is there anything else? Yeah, and again, we have the shocks. Uh, so hang on, this is, um, yeah. Yeah, here's the shocks. You can see them there at the wheel so that your aircraft. The only thing I'm kind of, well, not missing, but um, I was wondering is tie downs, but it's probably difficult to make them. Um, so they don't have tie downs. But apart from that, um, let's say, and who knows, because they're still working on this. <coughs> it's possible that we get tie downs in, in one of the next versions. Who knows? Yeah. Not that we need them now, absolutely. Um, and I would love to see if we could start uh, a bit like the airfoil labs, for example, in X-Plane. I don't know if, um, I mean, if, if you're only flying MSF. Is Ac um, um, airfoil labs in X-Plane, they have created a Cessna. It's 172 though, not 152. And you, 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 can give, you can get onto the wing and open the tanks. You can do uh, the, the check of the fuel, you know, is there water in there? Um, how does the fuel look like? Is there something swimming in there which isn't supposed to be swimming in, in the fuel? So, um, who knows? Maybe we'll see some of this uh, in the future. And I love that the doors open because it's such a difference, such a difference. It's really nice. It just gives this little bit of additional, um, oh, hang on, I'm in the other view. Yeah, now. <laughs> right, uh, but let's take away these here. Now it gives you also the pilot weight, co-pilot weight, front baggage, rear baggage. Uh, um, let's add a few kilos. Let's maybe do 15 kilos. Uh, by the way, talking about. See this? Um, depending on what your weight has been set, uh, they start putting in little boxes. And, and so this, this is now the version which has no seats in the back. 
just a big space where you can throw your things in. Um, you should maybe tie them down somehow uh, <laughs> so that they don't fly around in the, w in the worst possible moments. Um, and you can put fuel, so at the moment we have 21.7. I mean, you can always use this up here as well. So if we go here, go into kilos. So at the moment we have um, 21.7, is that, uh, yeah, that's pounds, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, about 15.5 kilograms or 21.68 liters, which is about 21.7, yeah, yeah, liters, this is here, okay. Um, yeah, if you, if you would like to have a bit more fuel, you can do this, or you use this. So, not sure if you can, no, I don't think you can, this is just showing you our empty weight is 490 kilograms, the fuel, we have 43 kilograms fuel in at the moment, maximum is 71, so we're a bit more than half the tank, payload max, 154 kilograms are in and maximum is 224, and uh, total weight is 688 at the moment, the maximum total, total weight that you can have is 758, and I'm pretty sure you need a bit more runway and you need to be careful when you are fully loaded, just to make sure that nothing but happens with the aircraft. Now, here's a cut. Um, for those of you that watch this uh, video and are simmers with uh, streaming and video production as well, you know how things are. Um, everything looks okay, everything looks fine. You're starting to do your show and uh, you don't really always watch the, the little monitor uh, window to see what the video does like. And then OBS throws your tantrum and opens up a window for which it doesn't have a, a source in OBS. It's these kind of layout windows. So what does it do? It takes the whole uh, simulator window, but half of it, and places it directly over the screen, which makes everything from this moment on useless because you can't see what I'm doing until uh, shortly before the takeoff because then I realized oh yeah great <laughs> so I'm doing this again um, show you what I did again basically what I did was um, uh, by the way engine health went to 99% from 100% because we have been flying. Uh, I realized it after the flight, which went successful. I actually pressed the ready for flight. And now knowing from, from what happened, what you should do is bring in the mixture fully and also crack the throttle already because the auto start function, the ready uh, for takeoff function does not properly, um, uh, yeah, it, it, it sets the axis, but after that you might actually stall the, or, or cut the engine again when the axis moves or something, or if you, if you touch it, then the mixture comes out again and the engine will stop. So already put it into full mixture and full throttle, and then you can, uh, uh, or not full throttle, um, throttle about an inch, about a centimeter and a half uh, put in. I do have a TPM from SciTech, still one of the happy owners for many years. I will never sell it until it breaks, um, which is very similar to what you see here with the throttle and the mixture. So I use actually my finger. I know roughly how much the half an inch thing is uh, by just uh, feeling it with my fingers. Yeah, the only thing that the TPM doesn't have is um, you do have these locks here, for example, here, you see that? And uh, here these, well, actually in the simulator also not, but in the real aircraft you actually turn. There's a possibility to turn and to fine adjust. Uh, they don't have that on the TPM, but it's a good enough uh, joystick axis. Very, f You can do fine adjustments um, with it reasonably well. Yeah. Okay, so...
Let's start everything by pressing ready for flight and you will see it brings up the whole shebang. It primes the aircraft. <laughs> the first time I heard this I was actually, <gasps> what's this? And now we have um, the engine running. Now because this is the second cut, the oil temperature, it will remember the state. I'm not sure if I said it already, but uh, the, the state is safe. In other words, it remembered that we already had warm oil. That's why the oil temperature is now okay. Uh, let's turn all these off. Um, beacon and enough light on. P2 heat on. Yeah. Now, the autopilot didn't work for me the first time round. What I discovered was something strange. As soon as I press the baro knob, everything is fine. Don't ask me why, but it actually works. The, the autopilot is working. I'm really glad about that because on my first flight, I couldn't use it. Well, here you go, autopilot. We do have an autopilot and it did actually work as you will see later on. Um, you should also use the trim. Oh yeah, and by the way, bring the RPM... R oh yeah, that's too much. So bring it all the way back to about between 850 and 1000. So I usually put it around 900 RPM. Yeah, and also you should lean... Lean it a bit. Yeah, you can see that the automatic mode actually leaned it already. So you have to kind of bring it back a little bit. Don't leave it on low RPMs with rich mixture because it could actually foul the plug or flood the engine. I think it's do this foul the plug thing. Um, now you could turn on the equipment. The autopilot is always on. Also the Garmin is always on. As soon as the battery is on, those two spring to life. Maybe not the most realistic uh, thing, but... Um, Okay, so we can now close the window, pull, lock, door is locked, and uh, yeah, now I have to remember what I did. So we had to wait, I had to actually chat around uh, for the oil temperature to come up because it was really in the cold and you should not take off or put, put a lot of power on the engine while the oil is still below the green band because it's still cold. But because we have done the flight and the oil is now nicely temperatured, uh, there is absolutely no need uh, for us to wait. So in a way, it's now quicker for you. <laughs> the oil pressure seems a little bit low, but that's because we are on a lower RPM. As soon as we give more RPM, you can see how the oil pressure is rising and uh, on normal flight RPMs that we're going to have. The oil pressure is nicely in the green area, so that works out quite well. Suction is in the green, that's fine. Also, power is uh, fine here. We have the alternator on, we have the battery on, um, and yeah, the fuses again. Uh, I'm not sure if they can actually trip. If, if, if they have kind of failure uh, scenarios where the, the fuse trips on you. Um, I don't know, or maybe that's something that's planned. We don't need flaps because this is a really large uh, runway. Um, what you also might have to do, where is the cowl flaps? Did it, oh, hang on, does it have a cowl flap? It's a um, carburetor heat, yeah. Um, you might actually need to use the carburetor heat. Not sure if we need it now for our flight. Uh, you sh should probably turn on the cabin air to get some fresh air in. And if it would be cold, you can mix it with hot air from, from the engine. Um, yeah, the primer, you've seen it quickly used. This doesn't thing doesn't have a fuel pump, so you use the primer. And actually one thing I did um, before is I quickly went into the dark. Uh, 
All right. Now, if there is no light, uh, you, we have the automatic flashlight on. Thing is, I turned on these and nothing happened uh, because I forgot. That's the benefit of doing it the second time. There is a switch for the panel lights. You need to turn it on. Um, and then the flashlight automatically goes off. That's, that's a setting that MSFS has just activated without me doing anything. That's the thing with the simulator. You never know what you get when you start it. By the way, there is also an overhead light and there's a switch. Where is the switch? Somewhere here. Oh. Let's see. Where is it? Yeah. Um, uh, there. So if you turn it on, then you have carbon light. It's not the brightest light in the world, but um, it's fine. And this is your instrumentation. You can actually change the brightness of the GTN. I'm not sure if I showed you this. Uh, already it's um, in systems, backlight, mitigation, medium. What are we mitigating here? Anyway, you can change the backlight so that it isn't that bright uh, when you are in during night and you can turn it up if you are in the day because it's easier to read. So this is what the thing looks in the dark. Also very nice. We can get rid of this here. Now let's go back to um, the original time, about 12 o'clock. Uh, yeah, now you can see it is a little bit on the dark side now. Uh, where is system? Um, Black light. Uh, no, let's put it on 12. Yeah, it's a kind of a milky glass. It's not the brightest thing, but it's okay. I only use it for orientation. Okay, that's it. Um, let's loosen the parking brake. Did I do it? Yeah, yeah, so I did. And let's taxi. Yeah, we are also in a different position. It's the position after landing. Uh, but, yeah, boom. Less than perfect this time, but it's just the way it is. There's no point me doing it from scratch again because the flight went actually well. And, uh, yeah, I just, just try to give you now that part that you lost because of the OBS uh, tantrums. We are about uh, two thirds. We have about two thirds of the runway left, so that's why I'm not traveling all the way up. But I just take this is a Cessna, okay? Even without the flaps, we easily are airborne before the end of the runway, easily. Okay. And I rolled here. Somewhere around here, I actually realized. I think when I got s when I stopped here, so that there was something wrong with the with the picture. What I will do now is there will be a cut and then the actual original footage uh, will come back. Hopefully as good as uh, this little interlude here. Right. How did that happen? I didn't turn that on. Oh God, how long is that on? Hmm. Yeah, it's my, one of these cases where I might have to actually do the video again because I'm not always looking at the preview. And somehow it seems that OBS has decided to fire up a an overlay. Let's hope that this is not a large part of that video. That would be a shame because then I have to do everything again. But anyway, the flight uh, good that we discovered it before we have taken off because at least the flight part I may be able to reuse. That's the stuff that you get as a video maker. Things go always go wrong. There's always something that goes wrong when you do a video. And uh, I don't like cutting videos. I like to have them 
as they go, but in some cases I might be forced to do it. Depends it's on, on how long this view has been, has been there. All right then. So slowly, don't be too fast. Bring the power forward. Full. Then let go of the brakes. And you need some rudder to keep it straight. And when you reach about uh, 55, 60, you pull on the yoke. You have to pull a bit. And then use, use the trim to, um, you know, it's not that realistic here uh, because we have the joystick axis um, which jump back so I use the up trim until I can let go of the yoke which is now and we got a we got a trimmed out aircraft you can see that we are currently climbing with about 80 knots so what you can do now is you can take a little bit of the power and also lean lean the because I put it in full mixture, you didn't see that now, but uh, I took, did put in full mixture before I started. And now you need to try and get it uh, to stay somewhere between 70 and 80 knots. Okay, now let's see if I can tell the autopilot to climb. So I'm um, feet per minute. 700 and alert I might also have to tell it to arm the altitude yeah altitude is armed don't forget that let's see what it's doing eh? and the other thing I'm activating is the heading mode which is the first one yep it's working And that means I can now change the heading. We are still climbing out with somewhere around 700 feet per minute. Says 952 with autopilot. Can you believe it? Yeah, it's a little bit uh, shaky. Goes up and down, but eh. let's see if it stops the climb around 3,000 feet should any moment now and then we will see that the speed is getting more yep the autopilot uh, or maybe not or maybe yes or maybe not oh uh, yoy I guess you better stabilize the aircraft first we are now in alt mode, but it's going up and down like a yo-yo here. Uh, maybe it gets stabilized. Now wait that the speed gets a little bit more. And then slowly reduce the power a little bit. And we stay somewhere between 90 and 100 knots for the moment. Now let's turn again. just for orientation that you see so we've we've been flying quite a bit south here now and now we are flying west and trying to get uh, trying to get eventually back to the airport to attempt yeah, yeah well the autopilot isn't great it's going a bit up and down but uh, it roughly keeps the altitude and to be honest I wouldn't do a better job than that now let's check something else See the EGT here. I need, really need to reprogram that key. That's stupid. So I need another keyboard for that. 
Um, see here the EGT is relatively high. Now what you can try is very carefully use the mixture, bring the mixture back Uh, but you need to be careful, you can hear that the engine gets slower. And I, I kind of put in some value that I've seen in some video here, the yellow thing. And I'm now trying to m lean the aircraft so that the EGT stays w a good part away from this maximum. I think that's the maximum here. Uh, if it goes above that, there's a danger that the aircraft will take damage. Again, I'm not a pro, right? Well, what you can see now, though, is that we're getting slower because we lost some power. I'm giving a little bit more throttle. So we're not getting slower than that. We're still getting slower. Okay, if need be, also give a bit more richer mixture. Yeah, But as I say, between 90 and 100, that's fine, at least for this short flight anyway. That's no problem. No. Somehow my little nav map is not seeing the aircraft. How come? I don't know. It should have, but it doesn't. Ah, well. No big deal. So we are past the airport. You can see it over there. Or you can see it also on the map. Yeah, we are on locator one, that's fine because we want to use the ILS. Yeah, the EGT has gone up again. But I think as long as it's below that one, we should be okay. And we stay in and around 95 knots. That's fine. Yeah, absolutely no problem. The autopilot has kind of stabilized on 3000 feet. Again, autopilot is not a absolutely important thing but um, yeah it's uh, it's okay so I wonder well we should be okay for the ILS uh, let's see the DME equipment uh, oh hang on yeah I turned off the DME equipment so I need to ILS zero uh, yeah ILS zero G ILS GS runway 07, yeah. Oops. Ah, 071, okay. Now, what I would do is I would turn again 90 degrees. Now, if you do have some idea of how I can use this EGT and do it a bit more properly than I probably do it at the moment, just let me know in the comments so that others uh, can read them too. Okay, so we do have reception. I would actually do is uh, reduce a little bit the angle so I'll kind of do roughly like 45 degrees uh, 
we are relatively low in brackets, 3,000 feet. Normally you uh, intercept the ILS at 5,000 feet, so I think we should be fine. No, actually we are not. I just realized we are above the glide slope, but it doesn't matter because, again, this is not an IFR flight. So I'm going to turn off this autopilot and now take over visually. And since we're a little bit above the glide slope, um, let's try and sink with more than about 700 feet. So I'm taking back the power I'm putting in the mixture to reach now for the approach. Leaving altitude. Yes, that's correct. I have a speaking airplane. She's telling me something. If the vertical speed isn't enough, just uh, give it a bit of trim. So we can now see the glide slope slowly coming in again. And the aircraft, if you trim it, you need to learn how to trim this particular sim aircraft, okay? Because it's different to the real world. Um, it's actually very easy because I'm hardly touching the controls. And, and the good thing, th this is actually what it is in the real world. In, in the simulator, we often have to really work hard on, getting, on keeping or leaving the aircraft in the attitude and all that. Um, there are some tricks how to do this so that it's very similar here. I use the alpha yoke today and uh, I, I hardly I hardly have to do anything. Now I'm talking too much. Hang on. <laughs> yeah, that's with video making. I was talking too much. We're a little bit below the glide slope, but that's okay because we're doing a visual landing anyway. And uh, we have lots and tons and tons of runway ahead of us. So absolutely no problem. We need to get a bit slower. So what I'm doing now is I'm taking the power off and then l not level off, but get a bit flat and just pull on the yoke and now bring out the flaps first stage. And second stage, but be careful because the aircraft will get slower now. About 60 knots. Use the trim if you have to pull a lot. And power off. Nose and not too much. This is this is something you will learn over time. Ah yes, look at that. And the thing is, it's not difficult in this aircraft. And the other thing is, this aircraft doesn't wear off to the left like many standard, even the standard version of 152. It would be all over the place. As soon as you touch down, you have to immediately react with, with rudder pedals because otherwise the aircraft tend to wear off mostly to the left. This one doesn't. And you've seen now, uh, I pulled, you learn how, how much you have to put in in order to get to this result. If you hear the stall warning shortly before you touch the ground, it's actually quite good. That's the way it should be. Um, and you've seen it was a nice, uh, a nice landing. So this mod is, it made a, a good aircraft, some, something that I liked from the start in MSFS. It made it into a really good aircraft, a fantastic add-on for no money. That's the good thing about it. Something that you can just go to flightsim.to. I'm going to put the link in. Remind me if I forgot, forgot it. And uh, 
and you have this fantastic little aircraft. So let's uh, quickly go, let's go there to the hangars and park somewhere over there. Ah, let's bring in the flaps. Turn off the landing, put the taxi lights on, let's turn off the strobes. I like the sounds. I'm not sure if the original one has a two like this. Could be a different sound, but I, I couldn't tell you now. Can't remember what the original one sounds like. But it's, uh, yeah, it's just place ourselves here. Yeah, come on, parking brake on. And uh, how was it now? Okay, oil pressure is a bit low now. But we are still above the red. That's because we have reduced the RPM. As soon as we give a bit more RPM, you can see that the oil pressure is rising. And the other thing is, oil really got warm now. So we are in the middle of the band uh, to that. By the way, here's the suction instrument. You can see nicely in the middle, in the green. So this aircraft still looks quite good let the engine run a little bit also to, to not to cool down but to kind of um, should there be some excess temperatures that they can reduce and what I always do is uh, where was this in the maintenance thing um, oh I thought it would show me the engine health but I guess that comes only when when we have turned everything off so let's do that then so let's turn off those lights and uh, also let's turn off the equipment the autopilot you cannot turn off it's directly linked to the battery but uh, these instruments you can turn off Not sure why they don't have as uh, an off switch. Oh no, that's uh, what am I doing? Uh, and this thing, I'm not sure, but this is the volume. I'm not sure if you can turn it actually. If you can turn it off. Home switch direct to. That's, mm, probably also linked to the battery, like the autopilot directly. Okay. So carburetor heat, uh, carbon air, put all that in. And uh, now let's slowly pull out the... Well, engine held 99%. That doesn't necessarily mean that I've abused it. It means that with every flight that you do, the engine will deteriorate a little bit because it's used. Yeah? And the lower this gets, uh, the more likely it is that you will have to do some, some maintenance. And that's, I think when you turn the switch, then it will put it back to 100%. So it's, it's a very simplistic, um, si very simplistic. Oh, why is everything on? Did I turn everything on? Did I really? range and alternator off battery off park brake is set oops for some reason this stayed there didn't uh, sometimes the buttons or the switches here on the alpha yoke they somehow don't get through <laughs> I'm not sure why that is um, okay let's uh, put this away and let's open the the door and out we go. And here you go. The what's it called? The M MB Sim? No, WB Sim uh, JP Logistics uh, Cessna 152. Cool stuff. Hope that was helpful. Until next time.